any time now. Come on, there we go. Okay. All right. Adjust my chair a little bit. Bump the microphone by accident. Okay, I think we're all good. And there we go. All right. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you, if that's the kind of thing that you're into. It is, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess it might be sunny today, not sure. It's not quite there yet. We'll see how it works out. <clears throat> Goodness gracious. All right, uh, let me see who we got here in the chat. We've got, hello from the Netherlands, uh, Poland, Cumbria, Adelaide, Australia. Hello from Finland. I've got something in my eye. Hello from sunny Scotland. Um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Canada, St. Augustine, Fort Saskatchewan. Worcestershire, uh, Columbia, oh, uh, Coruscant. Well, that's, that's a very good connection you probably got from here to Coruscant. Edmonton, Southwest Australia at a comfortable 24 degrees Celsius, which is warmish. Not too bad, though. Uh, Rotterdam, uh, Greece, Swindon, Finland, uh, Newbury Park, Doncaster, Round Rock, Texas, Windsor, the Netherlands, Jakarta, Pittsburgh, Missouri, Stoke-on-Trent, um, Krasnodar, Russia. Wow, that's I don't know. That's I don't know if I've ever heard or uh, said hello to anyone in Krasnodar, but hello. Sweden, Norway, uh, Charlottetown, in Canada, uh, Iowa, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. That's a lot of fun. Um, Lance C. S. did you pick up the Shadow Spear box yesterday? No, I have not as of yet. Uh, I was traveling all day yesterday to get home from Reno. I started traveling at 11 in the morning, 10 in the morning, somewhere around there. Got home last night, well, technically this morning, uh, about 8 hours ago. So 1 a.m. is when I finally got into uh, the house. So there's that. Uh, let me see here. Greetings from Austin, Fnordland. I'll be seeing Austin, Fnordland very soon. I'll be there for Fnordcon in the first weekend of April, uh, whenever that is. Uh, fifth and sixth, sixth and seventh, something like that. Denmark, Spain, Channel Islands, Brazil, Salt Lake, Utah. Um, what else have we got here? I was just in Salt Lake yesterday, as a matter of fact. Well, the airport. Um, Australia, Germany, Connecticut, Quebec, the Philippines, Essex, morning from Brooklyn, uh, Vienna, Austria, that's where they make those little sausages, I don't think that's actually true, <clears throat> Six Gunner 86 bringing the hot take questions right away, uh, Adam, which one do you like more, 40k or Age of Sigmar, hmm, um, I think I'm gonna probably, um, I think I'm going to kind of wuss out and say probably both. Uh, I have a tendency these days right now to be playing a little bit more, not 40k, but kill team, uh, which is 40k related, um, 40k adjacent. Um, partially that's just because of who I'm playing with. Like, um, you know, like a lot of times when you have opponents to play against, then you have a tendency to play that game more than games that you don't necessarily have opponents to play against. So uh, in the situation of kill team say let's versus age of sigmar right now um my main couple of opponents in age of sigmar have been very busy lately so i haven't been able to play um but the kill team stuff has been a little bit more readily available for play so uh, as far as painting is concerned yeah honestly they're pretty equal as well um like the nurgle rot bringers like the putrid blight kings for Age of Sigmar versus the Death Guard for, you know, 40k. It just, both of them are, are, are a treat. Um, I haven't painted any Stormcast, so I can't compare them versus regular Space Marines particularly yet. I have built a couple, but I haven't painted any, so that's a good question. 
Let's see here. What else have we got? Good morning from Frankfort, Kentucky, Topeka, Kansas, um, Fort Worth, Atlanta, Georgia, Kenosha. Um, just drove through Kenosha yesterday on the way home from uh, O'Hare down in Chicago, the big airport. Um, what else have we got? Got my first game of Kill Team coming up in the next week. Death Guard guys nearly complete. They're a lot of fun. Um, I like them. I like the uh, the Blight Launcher is one of my favorite weapons. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Floyd says hello from a very damp in Nebraska. Um, yes, I wa- had some conversations during um, Gamma with Jason, who owns a store in Omaha, um, the Geek Room, I believe. I think I'm saying that correctly. Anyway, uh, we've been talking for a while. Uh, he's an irregular. And uh, he said that there was a lot of flooding going on in Nebraska. We had some, much less so, but some here in Wisconsin as well. Um, Fond du Lac, which is about half an hour south of here, had a lot. And I guess Madison, which is the capital down in the southern part of the state as well, also had a lot of uh, flooding and streets closed and things like that and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, it's been a bit difficult. So, And I think it's just partially because all the snow... Uh, melted so quickly because it was there was so much snow and then at least around here that's the the, the thing um luckily and i'm knocking on wood uh luckily while i was gone the basement did not the nerd bunker did not really like there was a little bit of moisture but it was a spot where we always get a little wet when you know it gets rainy or cloudy or someone walks by and spits and uh so you know that was to be expected but otherwise it could have been a lot worse um absolutely Nicholas asks, do you have any recommendations of games to try and get my wife interested in wargaming slash board gaming? Was looking at Zombicide really, uh, recently. One of the big benefits to Zombicide uh, for something exactly like that is that it is cooperative. I would definitely look for a cooperative game so it is you and your spouse or you and you know your spouse and some friends or however you want to do it. And that's also a good, good point too is if it's just the two of you, sure, that's fine. But if you can also kind of make it a fun thing where it's you and some friends but you're all playing against the zombies. If um, I've got a good friend who uh, does a game night with his wife and other couples and things like that, and they have now started to pretty much just play cooperative games because if they don't, then sometimes feelings get hurt and you know things get a little competitive and whatever. But when they're all playing against you know the bad guys, um, the game, whatever, then it's just fine. So. Um, that's something to look at, I think, there, too, is definitely look for a cooperative game where the two of you, if it's just the two of you, are playing against the game, and then um, and then you don't, there's no hard feelings, there's no, you know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Torch asks, hey, Tabletop Minions, how was the snow in Reno? I didn't really see any snow. Uh, first of all, I didn't, like, we got to the building, we got there on Monday, and then yesterday, as we were waiting for the lift to pick us up and take us to the airport, we realized that was the first time we had been outside the building. Um, the Peppermill Resort and Casino is massive. Like, I, there were a couple of times we were, like, trying to head to one of the restaurants and we would get sort of lost. Now, admittedly, that's because it is a labyrinth of slot machines, frankly. Um, and slot machines, strangely enough, all kind of look the same after a while. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, there was snow in the mountains. We could see those out the window, but we didn't see any snow on the ground. Now, last year there was snow like during the convention. So people were like going out to the hot tub and having to walk through snow and then get in the hot tub, uh, you know, in the, in the big pool area and stuff like that. But otherwise, yeah, I didn't really see any snow this year. Um... Life After the Cover Save says that uh, Blackstone Fortress is cooperative. This is also a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what else have we got here? Grimlock Steve says, Anyone know, are they going to fix the Age of Sigmar skirmish rules anytime soon? There was a, and I don't have it anywhere near me, but there was a kind of an update to Age of Sigmar skirmish that was in a White Dwarf. Maybe the January? Uh, no, maybe the February or maybe December. Relatively recently, there was an update to, to White Dwarf, and so um, that's something I mean that, that they're going to do. But now I have a suspicion with Warcry coming very soon, or sort of soon, um, 
that they may not necessarily go too far in that direction. So we will see. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, let's see here. Alexander asks, what's a good first project for wrapping my head around airbrushing? Getting back some money from university next month and want to finally start down that road of the hobby. Uh, honestly, I would, I would just tell you to start with priming. Um, you know, prime some models and, um, and understand how you can really, like normally if you're using a rattle can, like you're outside, hopefully, maybe you're inside, but generally you should try to be outside with that kind of stuff, ventilation and all. Um, and you have them and you like put them on a piece of cardboard or on a table or, a, you know, sawhorses or whatever you do. Stick them on your car. And then, I probably don't do that. Uh, but then you're generally kind of spraying the rattle can from above and maybe trying to get down low to try to get it underneath. But there's very frequently with rattle can, it's difficult to get into all the little underarms and nooks and crannies and between the legs and all that kind of stuff underneath the gun if they're holding it in front of them. Um, sometimes it's hard to get in all those areas with uh, primer. When you are using a model, I'll use this one as an example. When you're using a model and you're holding it like on a holder, or you got it stuck to a pill bottle with some poster putty or whatever, and you're going to be airbrushing, you can hold it all kinds of different angles and shoot up underneath and get into all the nooks and crannies with your airbrush a lot more easily. And so that's one of the big benefits of airbrushing right off the bat. So that can be some quick wins for showing you, oh yeah, this is why airbrushing is cool, and do a couple of you know things like that. And then maybe you start working on some of your zenithal priming. So once you've done, let's say, all black or maybe a medium gray, and then you want to dust from above with a, a white color in your airbrush. Now, you don't actually have to hold the airbrush up slight because then it would, all the stuff would spill out. Instead, you're going, to hold the, the, you know, you're going to hold the model as if you were looking at it from above. When you're looking at the model from above, and I know this is way out of focus, but when you're looking at the model from above, this is where the light hits it from the sky, technically. You know, I mean, sometimes light's coming from uh, a fire as you're standing near it, and it's it's nighttime. You know, that's fine too. But generally, we get used to light hitting us from above and coming down. So, you spray, you know, top down on the model, and then maybe you know, very you know, just kind of go off of straight up and down a little bit to kind of help it. And you know, that's that's what gives you that cool zenithal highlighting. And then you can start throwing some washes on it and stuff like that. And um, that's like step two of your airbrushing. Getting in the highlights and all kinds of stuff like that, that's a whole different kettle of fish, as it were. <clears throat> Hello from Warsaw, Indiana. Oh, there's one of those in Indiana, too. Cool. Um, what else we got here? Monster Dev says, what's a good 40k army with low model count? Tired of painting skeletons. Well, skeletons are a lot of fun, though. Um, that's a good question. 40k low model count. Uh, well, not Tyranids, not, Age, or not um, Imperial Guard. Um, I mean, Grey Knights, a lot of people will tell you they're not a good army, though. Um, but there's not that many of them. Um, Imperial Knights, I guess you could go that direction, but then, you know, those are big models in comparison. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if anyone else has got some good ideas in the chat as well. Let's see, what else? Some people saying Death Watch. That's also a good idea, too. I can see that. Um, do, 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 do. Christian says, thanks for your good enough video, the video from this past Friday. It helps me so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I it, it's the video did quite well. And I'm glad that the, the, the um, idea, the story behind it uh, has, uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know, solidified for some people or definitely helped some people out. I'm glad I'm glad that that worked out. Uh, Animus says, hi from Argentina. Finally could watch the live video. Well, I'm glad to have you here. A lot of people are also saying Custodes, those big gold dudes. That would probably be a good one, too. Um, yeah, as far as the low model count, because they're costly in points. Uh, Matt Warner says, does anyone have any suggestions as to dipping a toe into P3 paints? I have one pot of the Eldritch color I used for Night Haunts. Really enjoy the quality, but confused by the packaged paints. Um, as far as P3s, I mean, I own like a, like a darkish silver that I like to use from them. Uh, I have a flesh tone, like a, a Caucasian flesh tone that I like to use um, that sort of fits in a niche kind of between the other... Uh, Caucasian-y type skin tones 
that I have from Citadel. So like I've got some real super pale and some heading towards more of a ruddy kind of, you know, dwarven almost. And this sort of fits nicely in there. Um, I think I have a couple other P3 paints, but I honestly only have a handful. Like literally I could hold them in my hand. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, the, the problem is, at least around here, is I can't find them very easily. So there's that. Grimlock Steve asks, Adam, want to repaint my 50 skinks for me? I do not, but I appreciate the offer. Um, I do, I did start from last live show when I was talking about uh, doing a weird kit bash for a kill team. I have built the first, it's not completed, completed, because I want to add some more accoutrement. Uh, but it is basically a, um, it's a lizard man with a bolter and a shield which he has made uh, fashioned from he I don't, I don't know if it's I respect it, its privacy so I don't know if it's a he or not I didn't look um, but it's got a uh, um, like a shield drone like the top from a Tau shield drone that it is now using as a shield uh, which is kind of funny and um, uh, and then it's got a bolter so I'm going to be going to Adepticon not this upcoming week but the week after and when I'm there, I'm going to spend some time at a booth called the Bit Sky, who is magical. It is a magical land, the Bit Sky. And uh, I'm going to dig through a bunch of stuff and find a bunch of bits to make that project go a little bit further. I already have the lizard folks that I need for that, but I'm going to need probably some different types of bolters. Like if I can find some older bolters, like from back in the day, like. I don't know, Phobos pattern. I may be making that up. I think that's a pattern of bolter. Um, but I want to find some older bolters, but they're still bolters. You know, specifically when you look at them, you go, that's a, that's an old bolter, but it's a bolter nonetheless. And I want to find some more uh, drone, those rounded top kind of sh dishes from the drones and stuff like that. So I'm going to be looking for parts like that while I'm at Adepticon. Daniel asks, hey, Uncle Adam, any chance on going to conventions in Europe? Um, in theory... Maybe on Monday I'm going to try to get a passport. I have to... I've been very, very busy lately, and so... But I know I need to get a passport soon, so I was going to try to go... I have to go to the courthouse. I have to get pictures taken before I go to the courthouse and all that stuff. And I thought Monday, maybe Tuesday, would be the best day for that. But Monday would be pretty good. So, potentially, um, I would like to go to the UK... Uh, uh, with my wife and I and um, and then stop by some places there and see how things go but as far as an actual convention in Europe that I don't know um, like the only ones that I really know of I mean are, there's Salute but that's like a one day thing I know there's more than that obviously um, I should probably take a look through the Game 4 app and try to find local conventions and things like that in, in Europe and find out what, what when they're going to be because we've added convention support to that's actually just a picture of a kitty. But uh, in my phone uh, is the Game 4 app. And um, there we, we've added convention support so conventions can list themselves in the convention finder for free and put their information in there. And hopefully more people can find more conventions and have more fun. That's the point. <clears throat> um, Wayne from Kenosha, Wisconsin says, Which army was your favorite army to paint? Gave you the most satisfaction? Um, oh, that's a good question. Recently, I'm going to say probably those Death Guard 4 kill team. They were a lot of fun to paint. I think they turned out pretty well. Um, gosh, that's probably right now uh, one of my one of my more favorites. The, um, the Black Templar Primaris that I did for kill team were fun, but I think that the shoulder pads could have turned out a little bit better. Um... Hmm, what else? I've got like five armies already b finished for um, for Kill Team, and now I can't think of all of them. Uh, oh, and the Necrons. Uh, the Necrons were cool, but yeah, I think it was probably the, 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 um, the Death Guard, I think, that I did for Kill Team so far have been the most fun so far. Um, what else have we got? Josh, longtime lurker from Scotland, first time asking, first time live, good to have you, and asking a question. To drill barrels or not, best, cheapest option for drills, electric or mechanical? I did a video about drilling your barrels probably two, three months ago, uh, so go back and check that out. It might be a Uncle Adam's pro tip in that part of that series, but take a look. I do have a video about drilling barrels. I am definitely pro drilling barrels. I think that your model's not done 
frankly, personally for myself, your mileage may vary, but I feel that my models aren't done if the barrels aren't drilled. And I showed in the pro tip how to use like a pin or a needle to start as a pilot hole and then take a hand drill and drill them. I don't generally use the electric drill for that because I will probably stick it through like this little soft part right here in your thumb in that little webbing. I'd be drilling and then just and uh, I cringed. Probably some of you did as well uh, as I told that story. But my concern is that that's what would happen and I don't want to do that. So the little hand drill, way, way safer in my opinion. <clears throat> Jacob Benedict says, Hey Adam, I heard that you were invited to the mini wargaming bunker opening. I was, which is why I have to get a passport. Because uh, it turns out Canada is a different country. Um, so, yeah, which I knew. But um, but when I was a kid, you didn't need a passport to go from America to Canada and vice versa. I, I think. I swear to God I remember that. But now you do. So, yeah. in the So, everything, you know, unless it turns out that I'm a secret... I've been watched by the FBI and I can't get a passport, which seems unlikely. Um, then, I, yeah, everything should be fine. And I'll be able to get to the grand opening, which I believe is on the 22nd of June in Welland, Canada, which is not super far away from Buffalo. So I'll probably fly to Buffalo and then rent a car and then drive to across the border to Welland. Um, otherwise, I don't. I guess I could fly into... Uh, yeah, I'll figure it out. All right, so yeah, that would be my first outside of the country trip because up until about two years ago, I pretty much traveled almost never. Let's see here. Um, how is the underworld scene over there in the United States and Canada? And uh, other parts of the world, if anyone else wants to comment, just curious as the scene in the UK has exploded in the last few months. Um, I know that there's a pretty good sized tournament going on at Adepticon in two weeks or a week and a half. Um, I know our, my local shop uh, has a lot of players. One of the big deals uh, that's been kind of interesting is that the local shop is finding that a lot of Magic players are not like leaving Magic, but they're also starting to play Underworlds. And um, I think partially it's because of the card combos and the deck building and that kind of stuff. Um, and then one of the benefits for the local kind of commission painters is that a lot of these magic players um, don't particularly want to paint or don't know how or whatever, or they're just not interested in it. But they would like to have some models that are, I mean, they don't have to, obviously, but they would like to have maybe have some models that look nice. And so there's uh, commission painters that have been getting gigs from a lot of magic players and whatnot and other types of gamers who are now playing Underworlds and want their stuff painted. And as a commission painter, and I'm not a commission painter myself, but as talking to several commission painters, they like it because usually everyone just wants you to paint their 3,000 point army, you know, uh, whereas if they come to you and they go, I need these five guys painted, that's a lot more fun from a commission painting standpoint than painting, you know, a humongous army. Because also, people who want you to paint the humongous army also want to get it for absolutely as cheap as possible, but they want it to look as nice as possible. Whereas if you go and say, hey, I want to paint these five guys, it's just a lot easier to get stuff done. So, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, greetings from Cairo, Egypt. Nice to hear. Uh, Pop Burnsy says the FBI is full of elf players. Wow, that's that's mean to say. Um, what else have we got here? The Harrower asks, thoughts on Warcry? Is it a mistake for them to go all chaos? Also, thoughts on whether it'll be a good gateway game? I'll probably talk about that in a little bit. Um, that's kind of the subject today, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it, I was kind of surprised. It was I was at I was in Reno when they kind of announced it. Um, like my thought was that they were really going to show it off, probably at Adepticon. So they sort of showed it off a little bit. Like there was no press event at Reno. There will be a press event, um, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, at Adepticon, um, which I will be at. And um, it, I, I suspect they will probably show even more of Warcry there. They could be making me a liar. They could decide, well, we already showed that little teaser video, so we'll talk more about it in the summer. It's a possibility, but probably they will talk more about it there. Um, I was kind of surprised, honestly, that they even showed off that video and talked more about Warcry. But um, nonetheless, yeah, it was interesting. <clears throat> Uh, Life After the Cover Save says the Tabletop Minions is a CIA hitman, no issues, getting the passport. 
Oh, no, dang it. The camera locked up. <laughs> Son of a gun. All right, you guys haven't caught it yet, but it's locked up over on my end. So, oh, then it started up again. So there will be a weird pause. So right now you guys are probably seeing a pause, but it will come back. Although by the time you hear this, it will already be back. Time travel. I don't know. I got nothing. Um, let me see here. What else we got? I'll keep answering questions while we wait for the video to come back. There we go. See, there it is. Um, Torch says, I'm excited to see the uh, mini Wargaming Bunker opening. Looks pretty cool. Yeah, I watched a video, I don't know, last month where they were going through and showing um, kind of where the work's at and stuff like that. And then, yeah, it does look really cool. <clears throat> Zingbo says, if Warcry comes out with a kill team level starter set, then I'll be tempted to give it a shot. It does kind of look like it's like that. Um, I mean, just from the box shape they've showed off from the stuff like in that video, which I'll talk about in a bit, it looks like there's going to be terrain and two forces. The thing that is interesting to me is that they're two completely new model sets, two completely new forces. That is is weird. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting, but we'll talk about that. Um are goat people a good choice for Age of Sigmar? My 19-year-old son says I should play them. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know. I'm no person to ask about the competitive scene, particularly. But A, goat people are awesome. Uh, they've just got great faces, and the models are great. Plus, they've just also had a whole new release full of stuff. Uh, new Battle Tome, uh, Beast of Chaos, and all that jazz. So, yeah, I, I think that they're in a good spot right now. Um, I am also looking forward to building my... There's four, I think there's four uh, Beastmen in the um, um, Blackstone Fortress. <clears throat> Excuse me, Blackstone Fortress has got, I think, four Beastmen, goat folks, in it. and um, But they've got, like, guns and stuff because uh, it's, you know, sci-fi. It's 40K. So uh, I'm really looking forward to having them in my uh, Servants of the Abyss kill team, which is the kill team that you can make from the chaos side of Blackstone Fortress, which is very cool. <clears throat> Pop Burnsy says, hope we see some more Dark Oath in Warcry. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Um, I picked up the Dark Oath, uh, or Warsworn, or whatever the heck they're called, the you know, for Underworlds, the, the, the humans that are kind of vaguely chaos. Uh, and they're kind of cool looking, so yeah. Uh, let me see. Hey, Uncle Adam, any ideas when Kill Team Elite will come out? Um... I don't remember if they said. Pretty sure it's going to come out before... Definitely sure it's going to come out before Warcry. And Warcry is supposed to be coming out in summer. So, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, they'll probably tell us... Well, they may or may not tell us at Adapticon uh, when, it, when Elise is coming out. But we'll see. Or it says so in the uh, video for it, which is one of the... Uh, yeah. Um... <laughs> Big Dick Cheney asks, when can I use my Bane Blade in Kill Team? Yeah, see, that's no. I, yeah, the thing with elites in Kill Team is is uh, like when they're like, oh, and you can take like, uh, you know, uh, uh, battle suits from, from the Tau and stuff like that. And I'm like, see, now we're getting into a weird area with Kill Team, at least in my mind. Now, depending on the rules, and maybe you can take like one, okay, that's fine. I mean, heck, you can, if for commanders, you can take a, a Broodlord, you know. Um, so, yeah, but I really hope that they don't decide, well, let's try to put vehicles in Kill Team now, because at that point, it won't be Kill Team anymore. It'll just be, like, small-scale uh, 40K. Um, Combat Patrol. That's what it used to be called. Combat Patrol used to be played... Uh, that's what, how I first kind of got into 40k, actually. In Combat Patrol, like in 5th edition, it was like 400 points, maybe 500, but I think it was 400 points, and there were certain limitations. But, but you could take vehicles. It's just that the vehicles, like back in the old days, vehicles had uh, armor facings. So you had like armor on the front, armor on the back, and then armor on the sides. And you couldn't have the armor on the front, the back, and one of the sides, because the sides were identical, add up to more than, say, like 33 points of armor. Um, but if you did, if it was 33 points or less, well, then that vehicle could be part of your combat patrol. If it was bigger than that, then you couldn't. So, like, you could take a Rhino, and you could take, you know, Dark Eldar, like, sort of weird scooty vehicles, and stuff like that. But you couldn't take, like, obviously a Bane Blade. You couldn't take a lot of things like that. You couldn't take... 
I don't even know if you could take a predator. I don't think you could. Um, but yeah, so that's how I originally actually got into 40k was was combat patrol. I like kill team better because it's a smaller thing, and I like the way the terrain is set up better. Um, but I'd prefer like. If anything, if they want to have people buying vehicles in small skirmish again, they could just come up with rules or produce, put, you know, it doesn't have to be a boxed set, but they could just come out with like a rule set, free PDF, you know, and and, uh, and tell people about Combat Patrol and, and then they could kind of work some vehicles into those lists. I think it'd be a lot of fun. <clears throat> Um, any idea for painting a forest style base? Um, I would definitely stick with, I mean, I would start probably with brown and do the majority of the base in brown. And then I would cover some of the spots of the brown with like some greens. I would definitely look into trying to wet blend maybe the brown and the green together in some spots. And then after that, um, I would probably get into try to find some, after that's all dried and everything, then try to find some, um, I mean, you could have some little grasses, but there's also stuff that you can buy. Oh, what the heck is it? I think it's technically birch tree seeds, but you can get them from like Seco Weapon Miniatures and places like that. But these seeds, which I think, are, like I said, I think are birch tree seeds, but when you look at them, they look like tiny, tiny little, um, almost like maple leaves. And so you can kind of glue those down as ground cover too that helps to make the base look like it's got a bunch of dead leaves laying on it and stuff like that. Um, you could also use, there's certain spices you can use that look kind of like ground cover, dead leaves and stuff. I can't remember what spices. But just go to the store, like grocery store, and look at all the spices. You know, stand there in the aisle and just look at them all real close. Don't talk to anybody. And... Um, <clears throat> I'm sure they won't throw you out. But uh, yeah, do that and try to find some of those things. That type of ground cover that looks like a bunch of dead leaves, that's what really kind of sells it and makes it look more like um, forest floor or whatever, something along those lines. Kr Krinken. That's a fun word. Getting some results from Game4. Recruited a member to our, or, yeah, to our local gaming group and got my closest store verified. And I should say that I live in a small town in Sweden. Well, good. That's glad to hear. Um, we got a lot of great feedback actually this year at uh, the Reno uh, trade show. So like I said earlier, I just got back technically very early this morning from Reno, Nevada, and I was there all week, Monday through last night, this morning slash, uh, there for my day job for, for, for Game 4, the, uh, the app. And um, I just realized I didn't close this door. So there's a weird dark spot. Hang on. There we go. So... Um, anyway, so yeah, we had a booth kind of on the back part of the trade show floor. Um, we were in booth 818 and um, had lots of people come by. and cause it, So the Reno trade show, it's not a game convention, it's a trade show. So store owners, retailers, they all come from all over the world. Um, met a nice guy named Bradley from South Africa. Uh, he's got a shop there in South Africa. And anyway, so... <clears throat> He was a fan of the show, which is, he stopped up and said hi. So, uh, yeah, there was, um, it's, all these people come and they go to seminars and learn stuff about running a store and this and that and the other thing. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, there is a trade show that goes on from like 1 p.m. until 6.30. And then the same, same the next day. And um, it's all these booths. And it's mostly all game company manufacturers, you know, um, Companies that make terrain, companies that make games, companies that make models, co companies that make, you know, and it's not just, it's certainly not just wargaming. It's tons of board gaming, tons of RPGs, uh, card games, stuff like that. It was a big Pokemon uh, booth and all kinds of jazz like that. And then um, it's instead of gamers walking up and down the aisles, it's store owners walking up and down the aisles. Um, but there's also companies there like distributors, who are the companies that buy the games from the manufacturers and then sell them to the stores, kind of the middleman persons. Um, so that that, that that way the store owners don't have to contact every manufacturer separately, which would be a pain. Um, and then there's also companies there like us who, you know, like work with stores, you know, and that kind of stuff and things. So yeah, it was, it was pretty great. Um, we had a lot of great response. We had a lot of stores telling us about how they've been really enjoying it. We signed up a bunch of other stores to, to get, start using it. And we also um, 
talk to it because a lot of store owners are also gamers. So they were telling us kind of stories about how it's been working for them and everything. Um, but we also had this year, we also had a, a more, a lot of um, a decent, well, yeah, we had, we had interest from manufacturers and distributors and things like that because they want to be able to advertise in the app. We do pay for the app with some, some advertising, but it's only uh, gaming related stuff. Like you don't have, you know, Blue Apron or Geico or, you know, those types of, we didn't go with a ad network. We built our own kind of ad engine and we're putting in ads from companies like Beetle and Grimm who have a license for Dungeons and Dragons stuff that they make. Uh, Battle Foam, some Kickstarters and things are in there right now. So that was really good too. But it was just good to like meet with a lot of different um, people. We've got some new things coming out soon for the app and all that jazz. But it was really fun. Um, tiring, very tiring. But it was fun. Um, I didn't gamble while I was in Reno. Though we did go to the arcade a couple of times. And then sometimes you get tickets. And then, you know, that's not exactly gambling. If anything, really, like some of those games where you get the tickets, there is more skill to it than just pushing the button to make the thing spin around in the slot machines. So I prefer that anyway. Alexander suggests that people use oregano on the bases to make it look like, uh, you know, dead leaf ground cover, um, and which isn't expensive and smells delicious. Well, that's as long as you don't try to lick your um, your models, then that should be fine. <clears throat> uh, what else have we got? Joe Mo says the great thing about Game Four is that I've made quite a few new contacts, friends who I wasn't actually able to play with because of the distance time issues, but we now share ideas and painting techniques. Well, that's very cool. I mean, because usually, yeah, it's more about like the close kind of like these people live near me and so we get together and play games, but it's cool that it's working for you in that way too. Neat. Um, what else have we got? Um, did you shoot a man in Reno just to watch him die? No. Um, I was gonna, like if there was, I know there's like a Reno sign somewhere, kind of like there's the big Vegas sign that's all famous. And I, I don't know where it is though. Um, I know last year when we went, I was going to uh, try to, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I was going to try to bring a toy gun, which is probably a terrible idea to bring on a plane, frankly. But I wanted to um, shoot uh, a man in Reno, a man being like Matt from, from Game 4. Um, uh, I've wanted to shoot a man in Reno just to watch him cry. So we were going to take a picture where I was shooting him with like a Nerf gun and he was crying. But uh, it, I didn't bring a Nerf gun, so um, I still haven't done that yet. But one of these days, I, I'm going to try to do that. I did last year take the red eye out of Reno, so I got that checked off my bucket list. Um, those of you who sat through the um, Irregulars live chat last year, when I got back from Reno, will remember that in that I nearly fell asleep while talking because I had been traveling for a, a really long time overnight coming back from Reno. So yeah, those of you who are there, uh, again, I apologize, uh, but uh, you know, I was trying to get uh, that going. <clears throat> um, what else have we got? Draco says, hey, good morning, Adam. First time seeing your stream. I'm, up, I'm over near Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Sorry I'm late. Well, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. I was going to go to the Fire and Ice um, uh, local convention, which is held in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, the last week in February. I was going to go to that a couple weeks back, and um, just everything was snow and ice, and so I didn't go, which... Probably a lot of people, unfortunately, didn't go, which is, you know, part of the problem with having a convention in Wisconsin in February. Uh, sometimes it's great, you know, or fine, and other times not so good. So, yeah, definitely. Moderator Matt in the house saying, well, I overslept, was packaging until the middle of the night. Moderator Matt is going to be getting ready, I'm sure, for Adepticon because Moderator Matt is part of the team, a big part of the team, by the way. He's the, the, he's the squishy middle. Not that he's not squishy. Um, anyway, he's the, he's, he's, he and uh, his business partner, Anton, are uh, Hyacinth Games, and they make Wreckage. They'll have a booth at Adepticon, and they will be given demos of the Wreckage skirmish game, which is awesome, by the way. And um, they'll be selling stuff, great-looking models, and uh, books, and all kinds of stuff like that. And... Uh, if you're real nice to Matt, he might give you some liquor. Maybe not, necessarily. Maybe. He's done it to me, but maybe we've just got a special relationship, which I think we do. 
But yeah, so um, definitely, if you're going to be at Adepticon, I really, really highly suggest that you stop by the uh, Wreckage booth and at least get a demo, and at the at the most, buy everything that they have available to, to, to sell. So, Mike G says, I mix catnip into my opponent's ground cover, and it's really been helping my win rate. Well, I suppose so. If there's a lot of cats around, I can see that. Yeah, if I did that around here, that would that would not work out. I would not have any models left. They would all be underneath the the cabinet over there, along with all the cat toys. Um, <clears throat> Anthony B says that downtown Reno has a bunch of neon signs you can take pictures by. Yeah, it's still one of those situations where like I've I've gone to that convention two years now, and I have never technically never left the building. Like I get there on the first day of the convention, and I'm just in the building the entire time, and then you leave. And I mean. There are probably half a dozen restaurants in there. Um, several of them are buffets. Uh, what night was it? Thursday night? I think it was Thursday night. Me and uh, not moderator Matt, but Matt from Game 4. He and I and uh, Billy, who's kind of the business manager who's uh, at, at Battle Foam and a, a super good guy. And then Chase, who works for Battle Foam as well. The four of us went to All You Can Eat Sushi. And um, it was... Uh, Slightly more than we could all eat, as it turned out. It was a lot of sushi, but yeah. So um, yeah, it was. We we it's it's just. It, I sh we probably should try to leave the building eventually, but eh, it's you know, it's tiring. Sort of after a long day of being, you know, there on the on the the trade show floor and all that stuff. <clears throat> Useful G says that Sleepy Adam was hilarious. Yeah, I was. It was. It was not great. <laughs> it was not great. Six Gunner eighty six says I took a, I took an, an advice from one of your videos and bought a fishing lure box for minis slash bits. It's a brilliant idea. Yeah, those clear plastic like things that you can keep fishing lures in. You see people use them for crafts and stuff like that. They work great for bits because you can keep all your bolters in his part and all your legs over here and all your torsos over there and whatnot. And it works out quite nice. <clears throat> Sam Hinchy says, so I've decided to switch from Citadel to Vallejo brushes. It seems they hold up better. I don't know that I've ever used a Vallejo brush. I mean, I've used plenty of their paints. I guess I didn't realize they have Vallejo at a booth at Gamma, and they have a whole bunch of spray cans now, Vallejo spray cans, which I've never seen before. Um, they're not, I don't, I haven't seen them for sale in any of the places that I go to, but I don't know they made brushes. I mean, it makes sense, but I would assume so. Uh, Alexander asks, did you see or play the Batman miniatures game? I was wondering about getting the models since they look very nice. I know a couple of guys from the Minneapolis area who play it almost exclusively now. They were originally fantasy players, and then when Age of Sigmar came along, they switched over to Infinity, and also some Batman, and then they got back into Age of Sigmar because they turned it turned out that they didn't it wasn't as bad as they thought it was, and um, but I know that one of the guys is definitely like all in on Batman. Um, I have not played it, so I don't know. I was at a small convention where it was being played a bunch, so I watched it for a bit, but that's that's the best I got. Um, I know or I believe that the majority of the models are metal. But maybe they've moved some to resin. I don't think anything's plastic with that with that line. It's difficult to do a smaller company, smaller line in plastic. So then you end up either going metals or resins. Um, you know. Um, let me see here. I used to work at a casino as a slot machine repairman. The stories I could tell you says uh, Kita K I T A. Um, yeah, there was a. There was somebody fixing one of the slot machines at one point we were walking by, and it was pretty interesting. It was like this, because most of the slot machines now are just a giant screen on the front, kind of curved for some reason, and so they had to, it, the whole thing kind of lifted up, and then there was all kinds of computer crap on the inside. So there's that. Um, hmm, seems to be some issues with daylight savings time. Uh, I suspect that Wisconsin goes into daylight savings time earlier than in most places. Mm, well, no, I mean, at least... The majority of the country goes into daylight savings time at the same time. There are a couple states. I think Arizona is one that's just like we don't pay attention to daylight savings time. I wish nobody paid attention to daylight savings time, but that's a different story. Um, 
Yeah, but I, we don't go any earlier or later than any of the rest of the country for the most part, from what I understand. <clears throat> uh, did I miss the first half? Well, not quite the first half, but yes, you've missed some. Uh, provinces, let's see here. Den, uh, Denny says, uh, my province is pretty much the only place in North America that doesn't observe it. Like I said, also seems, I think, Arizona, at least at last I heard. They may have changed things out. Irrational Gaz says the Vallejo colored rattle cans are a new line for 2019. That would be why I haven't seen them before. I I had a I I, I talked a little bit with the president of Vallejo. Um, to be fair, it was in uh, the bar and not during the actual. Like every time I walked by the Vallejo booth in the trade show, um, Alex Vallejo, uh, the president, was always talking to people, which is the whole point of the thing. So I couldn't. But at one point, uh, I, I talked to him for a while in the bar. And um, yeah, but he didn't mention the uh, the new spray cans, but they're pretty cool. John Kellogg says the next town over is Plano, where they make the tackle boxes. The Elbit store has great deals. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, uh, Plano is yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Carl Cassidy says I find the Vallejo brushes fantastic. The basic Torre ones are actually excellent. Streets ahead of GW. Streets ahead. I've never heard that term before. Um, yeah, I should try out some of the Vallejo brushes. I've never had any. Um, I'll have to maybe reach out to the president now that we've hung around in at the bar. Well, I met him actually last year at Origins. Um, very very nice guy. J Tick, the man. Uh, everything Batman has been moved to resin. That makes sense. Okay, I gotcha. That's right. I forgot you play it, Jay. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, Lama Juice says, Welcome to Daylight Savings Time, where the times are made up and the rest of the world doesn't matter. I, you know, because we used to sort of follow the rest of the world with Daylight Savings Time, and then sometime, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, we decided to change it. And it still throws me off. I mean, it's been, like I said, 10, 15 years. And then they're like, oh yeah, no, in March we're going to change it. I'm like, that seems weird. So yeah, I totally flaked on that one. Sorry, I should have put like a note on Facebook or something like that. Um... Yeah. The slot machines are embedded Linux and occasionally Windows computers. The buttons are wired as USB keyboards. Well, it makes sense that they would just be basically computers. Um, at least nowadays, because like I said they're you know some of, some of them are like humongous, actually very gorgeous displays. Like you get up close and you don't see pixels. Like they're really nice displays, and most of them are like touch screens and stuff. Um. Zingbo says, as an embedded software engineer, uh, daylight savings has caused me a great deal of pain. Yeah, no, that's also, we run into that same stuff with Game 4, actually. That's very true. <clears throat> uh, hey, Adam, any colleges or careers related to model painting? Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, besides being a commissioned painter... Um, I guess that maybe there's like a job. I've never heard any classes on painting models and things like that. You know, I took painting classes in college, but it was like painting on canvas and, you know, like this. That's how you do paint. That's how you paint on canvas. Um, the only thing I could think of is like maybe like you're going to work in museum displays and stuff. I don't, know. I don't Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of classes in that actually, as it turns out. Um, let me see. Would would dry dill be a good use for static grass? Hmm. I don't know that it would static like static grass. Like the whole concept of static grass being made out of fiberglass, I think, or whatever the heck it's made out of, is that using static, you can cause it to actually stand up as the glue is kind of still setting. Um, I don't know if dill would work that way. Plus everything would smell like pickles, which could be worse. I like pickles. Um, Evil Eyeball says that Dawson Creek, British Columbia, and Creston, British Columbia, British Columbia, have elected on a town-wide basis to not follow DST, which makes some issues for my computer job in terms of hours because we serve both those places. Yeah, that's the... It would be awesome if everybody was on the same page, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Um, yeah, that's... yeah. Lux says, after using sable brushes, I can't go back to synthetic. I don't know if I've ever used a sable brush. 
Like the most expensive brush I ever bought, I still haven't used yet. Which is one of the things about brushes like that. Like Sam, the majority of the painting that Sam does on his models is done with brushes that cost about $6 for five brushes or $5 for six brushes. They're cheap. They're cheap, cheap, cheap brushes. And he does, according to him, 90% or more of his painting with these super inexpensive brushes. Um, it's only when he gets into like kind of fancy freehand stuff like that where he might use more expensive brushes because he needs them to be a little bit more um, reliable is not quite the right word. Uh, consistent, I guess, is maybe the best word uh, for, for, for freehand. So, yeah, that's kind of a deal. Um, but, yeah, honestly, cheap brushes. He and I are going to make a video about it very soon, actually. We were just talking about this last time that we hung out. Um, we went to a movie... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Film festival. And um, yeah, he wants to do a video about brushes and talk specifically about brush types, brush dynamics. He is a big fan, as he's gotten more and more into painting, into using bigger and bigger brushes. You know, people always tell you you want to have these super tiny little fine brushes for that, but he wants to use bigger brushes that come to a nice sharp tip, um, which is why you go through cheap brushes, because when the tip falls apart, you throw them away, you get another brush because they cost 80 cents or whatever. Um, but when you have a, a bigger actual bristle area and everything like that, and it's a bigger brush, it can hold more paint and stay moist longer. So you're not having to constantly go back and refill your brush all the time. You can be painting and painting and painting and painting and painting and painting and painting. And then, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, we're actually going to be probably right after Adepticon. Right after? Well, not right after Adepticon, so I'll be going to Texas. But... Very soon after Adapticon. Probably in April at some point we're going to get together and shoot. Man, I hope we weren't planning on shooting this upcoming weekend. I'll double check with him. But yeah, we're, we were talking about it. And we're going to shoot very soon. And then do a, a whole thing about that. Um, and some other ideas he's got too. Generally, we, when we get together, we try to shoot at least two, if not three videos. Because just shooting one video seems like a waste. I mean, he's only driving 25 minutes to get here. Um, but yeah. Um, what else have we got? Hey, Adam, have you talked about Warcry yet? I want to know what you think. I have not talked about Warcry yet, but now since it's nearly 10 and hopefully, well, I think I might wait until 10 o'clock my time. So another seven or eight minutes because then the people who thought that it was going to start at nine, but daylight savings time, hopefully they'll show up. <laughs> since I don't want it. Yeah. Um, we'll see how that, we'll see how that works out. <clears throat> Darren says, I like your videos, Adam. I just started to try Age of Sigmar. Keep up the good work. Well, I, I appreciate that, and uh, good on you for starting to try Age of Sigmar. Um, you know, good to get into the hobby. It's it's a great hobby to... Um, I find... I was just talking to somebody actually on the bus, the shuttle bus from O'Hare to the parking thing uh, last night. Um, there were some people that I recognized who had been at Reno and had definitely flown back from Reno to Salt Lake and then Salt Lake back to Chicago and they're based out of Aurora, Illinois, and they're thinking about starting a store. And so I, I bumped into them on the, and we, we talked a bit on the, on the bus, and we were talking a little bit about um, painting as a stress relief and as um, like kind of a meditative sort of a thing. And, and, and so that was really interesting. Um, but yeah, definitely getting into the hobby like that, I think it's a great hobby to get into for those very reasons, stress relief, meditative, all that jazz, um, definitely. Uh, Marco asks, what do you think about Coolmany or Not's policy with miniature games? I think their models are fantastic, but it pains me to know that sooner or later they will drop the games as they're more into board games. Um, I don't, well, so, yeah, so, like, the, the only board, the only miniature games I can think of from them right now are Dark Age and Wrath of Kings. Now, I liked Wrath of Kings. I bought a bunch of Dark Age thinking I was really going to enjoy it, and then I painted up a, a small force and then played a game uh, with a guy who was really good at it, and he stepped on my neck and crushed me in my first game, and I really, like, I understood, yeah, okay, great, you know, that's fine. But I, there was just a bunch of times where I'm like, are you sure that's the rule? And he's like, yeah, that's the rule. And I, I don't think he was wrong, because at the time that I played him, he was technically the world champion. Now, it's a game that, like, they had a tournament at Gen Con, which he won, which made him world champion. But we're talking about, it was like 18, maybe 20 people. So it's not like, you know. But 
he was a very good player. He won that tournament at the very least. He was way better than me. So when I said, are you sure the rule works this way? Because that seems dumb. He's like, yeah, it is dumb, but it's the way the rule works. Um, it would have been awesome if he had not necessarily just stomped on me in the first first time we ever played. That all being said, I kind of didn't like the rules. Models are cool. Not all of them, but the ones I I painted I thought were pretty cool. Um, like I, That's why I picked that faction. It's because they, they look cool. Uh, Wrath of Kings I liked better as a rule set than Dark Age. Um, and the models I thought were cool. And they just decided that they were going to back Dark Age instead of Wrath of Kings. And Wrath of Kings sort of floated away. Uh, it was announced during Gamma that Asmodee, the French company that owns nearly everything in tabletop gaming, it seems. Uh, they own Fantasy Flight games. Uh, they bought Cool Mini or Not. This is what I heard. I did not see an official announcement, but the there was a lot of people at uh, Gamma, which is a big business thing, in the, saying that Asmodee bought Cool Mini or Not. So um, maybe things will change. Probably things will change. Things have a tendency to do that. But um, I don't know that that more miniatures will be the thing you see coming out of Cool Mini. I think it'll be more board games. Because if you look at the four genres in the business, you've got board games, RPGs, collectible card games, and war games. We're the smallest. We're the we're the we're the the the, the baby in that situation, in that family. Um, board games and RPGs, well, and CCGs really are all pretty much massive in comparison. So yeah, we'll see how that works out. Um. Let me see. So we've got a bunch of people talking about brushes. That's fun. Oh, yes, yeah, Song of Ice and Fire. Good point. That's also another miniature game that they did. That's the most recent one they produced. They did a Kickstarter for it. Uh, it's plastics, and it is based off of the whole Game of Thrones. Really more the books, though, I guess. But it's a rank-and-flank game where you're pushing around, you know, rectangles of models. Like, you know, it's like a rectangle like this, and there's a bunch of dudes. And you... I'm not a big rank-and-flank player, which is why I never really got into... Uh, Warhammer Fantasy, but yeah, so that's kind of a thing. But I, I had forgotten about them. Good point. <clears throat> do I have any coffee left? I do. Uh, Brian Etheridge asks, Hey, Uncle Adam, any thoughts? I actually, I added the hey in there, sorry. Uncle Adam, any thoughts on Burrows and Badgers? Um, Burrows and Badgers is a, is a skirmish game of anthropomorphized uh, creatures. So it's like, you know, burrows and ba it's like badgers and rabbits and stuff like that, but they walk on hind legs and carry spears and wear armor and whatever. Um, so it's a skirmish game like that. I don't have any of the models, but I do have a copy of the book. Uh, Osprey sent me a copy of the book to look at last year. And um, it's a hardcover. It's a very pretty book. Um, I didn't haven't got a chance to play it or anything like that. I'd like to do a demo just for fun. Uh, it doesn't necessarily... Model-wise, I don't know that it would be my cup of tea, but um, it's, I mean, it's, I, I think it's, it fills a cool area within skirmish gaming in general, and I think that the, it, it's going to attract, it's going to basically attract a certain spot that has not been attracted before, you know, like either younger players who are into that stuff, or, you know, just players who are more into the kind of I don't want to say cutesy because that sounds dismissive, but you see what I'm saying, like the the, the 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 less serious kind of sort of fun kind of thing like that, but still a skirmish game and there's some battles and things going on. But yet it's not like overly goofy. Like they're taking it serious, but it is at its base kind of. I mean, the whole thing is goofy. We're playing, we're pushing dollies around the table. Don't get me wrong, but that's yeah, exactly. Uh, Andrew asks, can you talk about Kingdom Death Miniatures? Um, technically, I can talk a little bit more about it than I could have a couple days ago. And the reason for that is, is because, as I mentioned earlier, on Thursday night, I went to dinner with, um, well, actually several nights, we went to dinner with um, some of the folks from, from um, Battle Foam, specifically Billy, uh, who's kind of the business manager there. And uh, Billy... Uh, plays Kingdom Death and likes that game quite a bit. And I had always heard about it, and I've seen the models and all the crazy shenanigans and all that stuff, and I was always just like, I don't know what the heck is going on. Like, I've seen people demoing it at at um, like Gen Con and places like that, and it always looks like it's just like you put three models on the table in a big rectangle, and there's no terrain and uh, whatever. But he was explaining a bunch about it to me and like how it's done and how it's got some sort of RPG elements and 
and you're playing like a series of different things and there's all kinds of and there's a huge deep backstory and all this stuff and and like the base game is four hundred dollars or something crazy like that so you know yeah and how he's been you know chasing certain like kickstarter only like models that he didn't get and this and that and the other thing and all that kind of stuff it's very interesting like i've never people talk about it all the time i see it on instagram all the time people painting up the models um sam's painted some of those models and stuff on commission and and, and a lot of them are amazing but um yeah still not i still haven't played it maybe one of these days i'll take a demo but i did not realize it was as deep as it evidently is so uh yeah we'll see how that goes out CJ Lake asks, has anyone ever tried making and selling terrain? I was pretty good as a teenager. Got a big order for the local GW store and then got stiffed on payment by the manager. Oh, well, that's not cool. That manager's a bad person. Um, I have bought some pre-made terrain before, like on eBay, people that were making parts, or like not parts, um, just like little buildings and hills and things like that and then selling them on eBay. I think that there's probably... I mean, you're not going to get rich doing it, probably, but maybe as a side gig, if you want, if you just really enjoy making terrain, and you make a bunch of terrain, and more terrain than you have a use for, and you start, you know, selling it on eBay. Um, if you have certain styles that you build, kind of the same over and over again, I think you can probably build up some, like a following. You know what I mean? That might not be a bad way to go about it. So yeah, um, yeah, I could see that. Uh, the Crushinator asks, Burrows and Badgers? So basically Redwall turned Skirmish. Um, I don't know. I know I've heard the, the, the word Redwall before. I don't know if it's based off of like... I mean, it's a little bit almost like Mouse Guard, a little bit, but like a Mouse Guard Skirmish game, maybe. You know, Mouse Guard, if you're in, familiar with that, I think that was a comic book? Question mark? I don't know much about Mouse Guard either, frankly. Um, but yeah. Mylar says, as someone who only watches these videos out of a general craft interest and doesn't really participate in the gaming, Burrows and Badgers does attract me with the cutesy factor. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is this is this is, I think, something that's sometimes missing in the industry that we don't think about. Um, so, good on you. There, I, I appreciate that. Uh, let me see here, Alexander. I was wondering which war game has the biggest tournament scene. Uh, it's going to be probably 40k. Um, Warhammer 40,000 has got probably the big tournament, the biggest tournament scene. I mean, at the Las Vegas Open back in February when I was there, the championship tournament had, I heard, anywhere between 700 and 800 people in it, which is a lot. Um, I know that the Warhammer Championship tournament at Adepticon, they cap at 256 players, but um, they have a waiting list that's nearly that again like another 256 so yeah it's definitely a big deal as far as the tournament scene is concerned um definitely uh tyler miller says i played kingdom death monster a while back it was fun but tons of admin and kind of gross yeah like a lot of the creatures are um unique and also gross uh from what i can tell so there's that but some of them are also amazing. Amazing. Uh, Lux says that the Dragon Goblin from Kingdom Death Monster is the best model I've ever seen. I know there's a lot of crazy, crazy models, and, and a lot, and, and they're not cheap. Like, the, And the thing is, is that they always have a booth at Gen Con that's humongous, and has got a line around it all day long. And I've just it's just so weird for me. As It was really actually interesting to have the conversation with Billy from Battle Foam because he's in it and they play it there sometimes at the at the, the warehouse slash factory and all that kind of stuff and he was saying that they were getting together and playing it and things like that and he was just like explaining it all to me and it was just one of those things I've just never really you know like I've talked to plenty of people who paint it and some people who play it but I've never experienced like what it was like so I, I don't know I, I would like to play a demo and just try it out someplace and see what it's like I think that'd be kind of interesting um Dan Hughes has done a quick search of all the various board game news services and can't see anything about Cool Mini being bought by Asmodea. It'll be massive if it's true, though. Like I said, that's what I heard during um, Gamma, the trade show, which is when all the industry folks are around. So maybe it hasn't been announced yet, but that was what I had heard during um, the trade show. So, I mean, I heard a lot of different things during the trade show. Uh, I kind of heard, like, roughly when the... Um, 
camera locked up again. Son of a gun. Um, but yeah, I kind of heard some, it's like when certain things are maybe going to be coming out and this and that and the other thing. Oh, that's a terrible face that I'm making. Now, is it going to like pick up again or am I going to have to unplug it, plug it back in again? I think I'm going to have to unplug it, and plug it back in again. Um, give me a second. I'm going to unplug that. Okay. And then plug this back in. Well, that didn't fix anything. Plug that. Aha, that's better. Plug that back in. I really need to make that um, technical difficulties uh, little graphic so I can put that up. <clears throat> All right, in theory, it'll come back in a second. We won't be seeing you make that terrible face anymore. There we go. Um, let's see. Damien asks, did you ever play or see a game called Ex Illis? I miss that game. Yeah, I do remember Ex Illis. Uh, they used to have a good-sized booth at Gen Con every year. Ex Illis was... Again, kind of a rank and flank style, if I remember correctly, a uh, miniatures game. It had some actually decent models, and also when you bought it, it came with plastic, like molded tiles that you put together and painted and whatever, and that was your actual playing board. But then you played it like with a companion, like a uh, laptop or something like that. And so when you were like, oh, I want these guys to attack those guys, you did it on the laptop and it figured out all the math and did all the stuff and rolled the dice or something like that. And it was kind of an interesting thing, but the models were pretty cool, and those tiles were awesome. Actually, uh, I've got a friend, uh, Kevin, who's got a whole bunch of them still, but I don't think he's ever painted any of them. I think they were a foot by a foot, or maybe they were like a weird European, not that weird, but you know what I'm saying. Like, they weren't foot by foot, but they were like 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters or something like that, which, if you're trying to fit it on a 4 by 6 table, makes it a little squirrely, but, you know, there it is. Um, yeah, uh, anyway. Um, what else? Let me see. Cool Mini was not purchased by Asmodee. They just acquired the rights to distribute it in the States, which they already do overseas. Well, that could be what it was, but there might be more beyond, more beyond that as far as, like, well, the reason they're distributing it is, yeah. We'll see. That's What I'd heard originally was that that was the issue, um, or that was a lot of people were talking about it, but certainly they could have been wrong, and then I heard it, and now I'm wrong, which is also fine. Um, nonetheless, I don't know. I, uh, it'll be interesting to see what Cool Mini does because you're right. Like they have been sort of, other than the license with Song of Ice and Fire, they've been kind of moving away from miniatures and they're a lot more hot about board games. So we'll see how it works out. Um, Damien asks, Adam, what happened to Bastion Games? They did X Illus. Do you know? No, got no idea actually. I don't know what happened with them. All right, so why don't we talk a little bit about Warcry? It's past 10 now, so the people who were confused by Daylight Savings Time, uh, you know, um, are, are hopefully here. So clicking on that, doing this. There we go. Okay, so oh, I move over. So the, the at the Gamma Trade Show um, on the 11th, which was actually pretty early, it was like Tuesday maybe? Monday or Tuesday? It was one of the first days. Um, they just basically, yeah, here, 12th, uh, they just basically said that, oh yeah, by the way, um, Warcry, like they'd already announced it obviously at LVO and told us what the name of it was going to be and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then all of a sudden they just started talking more about it. Um, and then they had a video. So they, here's what they're saying. It's a new skirmish game from the makers of Kill Team and Underworlds that allows you to experience the visceral carnage of battle in the mortal realms in a whole new way. It's more than just a skirmish version of Age of Sigmar. It's hyperkinetic, it's tactical, and it's very, very bloody, fe featuring bold new game mechanics. So from that, we can kind of take into consideration the idea that it's not just... So, like, when they announced Kill Team, they said Kill Team was not... 8th edition 40k which is almost true I mean it is technically true it's basically 8th edition 40k but they tweaked things a little bit here and there so it's not just like oh you're playing 40k but on a smaller board you're playing slightly modified 40k on a, on a smaller board it's it's based in the same it's from the same neighborhood absolutely um, 
Like if you go back and look at Shadow Armageddon, Shadow Armageddon is not second edition 40k, but it's very much the same. It's got, you know, like your your rerolls for, um, like whether you ran out of ammo and you've got the, suppre- not suppression fire, um, sustained fire dice and all that kind of stuff. You know, those things that you had, those mechanics you had in second edition, they basically just took that and said, here you go. And in this... Uh, in Kill Team, they were basically like, here's, you know, 8th edition, we've tweaked a little bit, but it's basically kind of the same thing. Um, here they're saying that it's not, it's more than just a skirmish version of War, uh, Warhammer Age of Sigma, or it's blah, blah, blah. Okay, so different, but probably based off of the same general area. Now, if it was, like, if they were just like, well, we're not going to put in ballistic skill or weapon skill, and we're not going to, you know, any of that stuff, and we're going to completely change up all the stats, number one, that would be weird. Because the whole concept behind these types of games, Kill Team, Warcry, is so that you can start small and then eventually get into the bigger games where you have to buy a whole bunch of models. That's that's the, the idea is to get you in the door that way. Um, but yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like that's if so. If you made it so that the rules were in completely different and then went that way, uh, it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Just like in um, Warhammer Underworlds, that's very different because there's cards and the combos and all that stuff than Age of Sigmar. But there's also a War Scroll that you can, Age of Sigmar War Scroll, that you can download for every one of the different factions in um, Underworlds so that you can use them in Age of Sigmar. So I have a suspicion, yeah, it's not exactly Age of Sigmar, but it's going to be very, very closely tied to the Age of Sigmar rule set. Um, that's just my, my belief. I could be wrong, certainly. Uh, Warcry is perfect for narrative players looking to forge character-driven campaigns where warbands grow and develop through their own journey. Meanwhile, gamers looking for a close-matched, fast, and exciting experience will find a game that fits both their coffee table and coffee break. So, I would also be extremely surprised if the board was probably not 22 by 30, just like the Kill Team board. Because of just the boxes alone, like the manufacturer and stuff like that, I would be expecting that they would be selling the boxes, but we'll see. You know, the same they'd be ordering the same boxes from the same plant and all that jazz, most likely. Here's the box. Um... I was a little surprised by the red. I don't know why. When I first saw this, I was like, huh. But I was kind of surprised by the red. I, it just it doesn't really matter. But uh, yes. So this is also interesting. Uh, in the game, you'll follow the myriad tribes of chaos, reavers and despoilers from every corner of the realms as they make their dark pilgrimage to the Varen Spire. There's a lot of spires in, in Age of Sigmar. Age of Sig Spire is what they should call it. Uh, Warcry explores a never-before-seen side of life and death. Well, yeah. In the Age of Sigmar, every model in the, for this game is brand new. That's weird. Um, I kind of just assumed they were going to make it so that you could use the normal Age of Sigmar models, and then they would just, you know, throw in two sprues of models, kind of like they did for Kill Team, and then throw in a bunch of terrain, and then, you know, call it a day. But instead, number one, it's currently Chaos versus Chaos. And number two... All the models are new. So I don't know if the models are only for Kill Team. We don't know yet whether or not down the road you'll be able to add other stuff. Like if you decided, well, I want to play Sylvaneth and you're going to play, you know, Putrid Blight Kings or whatever. And then we're going to play Warcry because they've got rules out for it. But it's interesting that they've decided, first of all, it's Chaos versus Chaos which is, you would think they would go chaos versus good guys, or chaos versus, I don't know, tree people, or whatever. But instead they went chaos versus chaos, which is odd. Secondly, completely new model set, which is also kind of interesting. So that's, I mean, I guess I didn't expect them to completely, word for word, follow the same recipe as they did with Kill Team. That would be weird, I guess. But it They've thrown me for a loop in a couple of spots. Let's just say that. But, you know, good on them for innovating. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, going down that direction. Um, every model in this game is brand new, reflecting on the dizzying diversity of chaos on a scale never attempted before and rooted in rich lore that realizes the servants of the dark gods as deep and varied cultures. So we're taking a look at, at, at chaos and we're learning about their culture and... Um, and they're, they're interesting peoples, and then we're going to kill them, or they'll, they'll kill each other, whichever. Uh, we'll have more Warcry news for you and some closer looks at those stunning models in the coming weeks. Make sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that's pretty much what they released at um, Gamma. Uh, but there's also this thing, which if I play it... 
So, we've got what looks like um, kind of like kill team type, type plastic terrain where you have, you know, you've got those, uh, what if I do hit the blow up to full screen? Nothing. Probably because I'm not playing right now. I have the choice. All right. So, you can see there's a lot of like ruins and, and you know, fantasy looking stuff, but it still looks kind of like the, the scale, at least, of the kill team terrain. But then you also see there's a bunch of cool wooden, uh, like, improvised, like, walkways and catwalks and stuff like that, which is very cool because it allows the game to have a bit of more of a three-dimensionality issue. Um, and you can traverse between ruins and stuff like that. And I really like that. I think that's very cool. Um, it looks like that model right there has an oval base, which makes me think it's a little bit more cavalry-ish to some degree. So I think that's kind of interesting. Skirmish warp. Oh, hang on, let me go back just to scotch. That's pretty cool. So again, we're looking at um, a lot of axes. There's probably not going to be a lot of range combat in this. And these guys look, frankly, a lot of corn on corn, which means there's probably not going to be a lot of magic, but maybe not. They could be... Like, nobody here really looks Sylv... Or not Sylvaneth. What's the... Slanesh. I don't see any Slanesh really going on here too much. Uh, but then again, I also don't see Nurgle, which is sort of surprising, because, you know, GW likes their Nurgle quite a bit. I do too, I'm not going to lie. But, um, yeah, so, I don't know. The The terrain stuff looks pretty cool. I have a suspicion this is going to be a big box that's going to have a lot of terrain in it. And then, of course, it's got the two, um, you know, the two armies. I did hear somewhere, and I forget where... But I heard somewhere that, th as many people have noticed, the Kill Team initial big box disappeared. Like, they ran through their initial print run and they were like, well, okay, now you got to buy the book and you got to buy the terrain separately or already have your own terrain or whatever. But you got to buy the book. You, so anyone, people who keep messaging me saying, well, I can't get into Kill Team because they don't have the starter box anymore. Why don't they make the starter box anymore? You can just buy the book. And then if you want the specific Kill Team terrain, they do sell it. But it will not cost as, as, as much as it did in the box because the box was a deal. That's how they get you in. If you didn't get that big box, you can still play. You just need to buy the $40 book and then use whatever the heck terrain you want and, and whatever models. I mean, within reason, the models have to be from the factions in the book to some degree. Um, but yeah, just because it's gone like that, that starter box is gone, doesn't mean you can't play Kill Team. What I heard about Warcry is that this starter box is going to stay in production. So once they sell through their first, they'll have a, a reprint or whatever the deal is. But they're planning on keeping this like a normal thing. Again, this could be falsehood, but it's what I remember hearing. Um, again, it could be like Asmodee bought Cool Benny, but that's what I heard. Um, anyway, so this will be interesting. I think it's going to be the stuff in here. Oh, there was... That was... I missed it again. Dang it. There. Those guys are kind of cool. Like, beastly, like, weird. Like, that thing looks like, looks like a dog with a goat head. That's fun. Um, that guy looks like a guy wearing goat skull, I think. Something. Yeah, so the, the models that I've seen, I mean, they're pretty short, like, little views, and there's a lot of shallow depth of field going on there, but pretty interesting looking, in my opinion. Um... Let me see here. What's going on? That guy's pretty cool. He's got a cool helmet. I like his helmet. I should probably... Is it... Am I blowing you guys up with the audio? I can't see... Sorry. Okay. I didn't realize that it was blasting you guys with the audio. I apologize. I can't see the chat screen and what I'm doing and everything else all at the same time. Um, all right, so I've turned off the audio now, so now we can see this stuff. Sorry about that. Um, a bunch of these guys, they all look like pit fighters to some degree, you know what I mean? Like it looks like, um, what do you call it? Like, a, so you know, that's, that's, a, a, that's some pretty interesting looking terrain. And if a bunch of that comes in the box, got a big cool bell over there, that's pretty cool. 
Um, yeah. What else have we got? Skeletons stuck on a spike. That's always fun. Um, I gotta say the terrain looks pretty awesome that, you're, that they're showing here. Now, I don't know what these symbols are for. I don't know if they're different factions within just this game. I mean, like, obviously there's, like, there's an eye there. There's, like, a weird beastman kind of look. That, yeah, I don't know. Um, it'll be interesting. I Like, I'm wondering if they're gonna... It would be really weird if they just decided to make, like, a totally new model line just for Warcry, and it didn't work with Age of Sigmar, but they call it Age of Sigmar Warcry. I mean, certainly they could also make Age of Sigmar rules for these models as well. Um, but it would be sort of odd if you couldn't use your current Age of Sigmar models to play Warcry. But then maybe they'd get you to buy more models that way. I don't know exactly how it works. Like, that's one of the things that was awesome about Kill Team is that if you could just buy the book for 40 bucks, and then if you already had some models, that you could just use those. If you already had some terrain, you could just use those. Maybe this is like, well, we want to have specific models for Warcry that you can use the other way and put them into there. Maybe a new faction that goes into Age of Sigmar. That's a possibility. Um, so there's that. Like, I don't know what this all means here, but you've got some of the symbols down there. You've got whatever this dude is over here with his strange... It looks like he made a spear out of a spine. That's He's crafty. you got to give him that. This person's got an interesting chain with a ball on the end. Um, you got to see some symbology there. So anyway, yeah, summer 2019, evidently, is when this is all coming out. Um, there we go. Uh, anyway, that's what we're that's what we're doing there. Um, evidently, this is the I was blowing you guys out with the video there. I apologize, um, but yeah, that was the uh, that's what that's what came out. And so, if you've watched it now, you know about as much as I do. Um, like I said, I have a very strong suspicion that they will announce a lot more in a week and a half. Uh, at Adepticon. So not this coming Wednesday, but Wednesday after that. They'll have the press event and go through all of that. Um, what else was I going to show you guys? Oh yeah, um, just some of the stuff from Gamma. Some of the pictures that I took. If you follow me on Adep Adepticon. If you follow me on Instagram, you've probably already seen these, or you've, I think they also showed up on they also showed up on Facebook as well. Um, these guys had a good sized booth. This is the Parabellum War Games people with a game called, I think I called it Conflict, but I think it's actually called Conquest. These were super cool, uh, kind of interesting displays and models. Um, the game is a rank and flank style game, which means it's kind of sadly unlikely that I'm going to play it because I'm just not into rank and flank, but uh, very cool models nonetheless. Um, this stuff is made by a company called Monster Fight Club. Uh, Monster Fight Club is mainly run by a guy named John, and I forget his last name, and I apologize. But he worked for years for Gale Force 9, kind of helped run Gale Force 9. And so he left and started his own company called Monster Fight Club, and now he is making pre-painted terrain like Gale Force 9 kind of used to, or still sort of does, except that he's going to keep it in stock. I had a conversation with him for quite some time uh, during the, during the uh, trade show, and he said that one of the big things is that Gale Force 9 has had a tendency in the past, and I made a video about this years ago called uh, Why Do Some Game Companies Not Like Money, about how they would make like trees and uh, Gale Force 9, which people would buy because they were pre-made really great trees for wargaming, and then you couldn't get them anymore because they were out of stock, and like everybody wants trees, usually. So why not keep trees in stock? And they just wouldn't. Um, well, uh, and I mentioned that to him, and he's like, well, that's number one is that our base stuff, like these particular types of trees, he's like, we're always going to have them in stock. You know, that's we're we're planning on, on keeping these in stock as long as possible. And they're very cool. They're like, the thing that's super cool about these trees, besides the fact that they're pre-painted and they look gorgeous, and that's that's just really kind of cool, is also, you'll notice here, uh, my, my hand model uh, mat um, from, from Game 4, you can take the tops off the trees, and then you have dead tree underneath. Um, the thing that was also interesting was that um, John was telling us you could take one of the tops off of one of the trees and put it on top of the top of another tree, and then you've just made yourself a taller tree. 
and he says it works perfectly and looks great and then you've got like a dead tree over here and now a taller tree over there or however you want to do it so they're very modular that way he said you can even just take the the the, the, the bottom part of the tree out and now you have like a giant shrub or whatever you know that kind of stuff um so yeah just really cool stuff um and then like the rocks and like some of the scattered terrain like dead trees and the well and jazz like that so this stuff would all come pre-painted um really reasonably priced i forget the numbers but i remember as he was telling them to me i was like that's a pretty good price so um this stuff is going to be coming out through distribution i think sometime in june but i believe that there will be a kickstarter as well um but you'll be able to get them like these pictures were taken in the i think alliance it was alliance or acd one of those two distributors that starts with letter a i'm pretty sure it was alliance uh in the alliance booth at uh Adep or not at adepticon at um gamma so i know they'll be sold through distribution as well but i guess he's going to do a kickstarter i mean you know that's it, it is technically a new company so i i get that um yeah so that stuff was really cool and i really enjoyed seeing those trees those were very cool and then there was some shadow spear shade yeah yes i think i said yes shadow spear i was like shade spire shadow spear it's too many words um these guys were all in a glass case and you could get up real close and look at them and i took a bunch of pictures um just pretty amazing looking models i someone asked earlier in the show if i had gone and picked one up yet and i didn't yesterday because i was traveling but i'm probably going to pick up a box today from my local shop if not today tomorrow definitely um yeah just like no one's ever i've never wanted to run possessed chaos before because the possessed models always look so goofy these new ones look really really nice so that's pretty cool um not only are the models awesome, but these are also painted super well. Like, really nicely done. I I, I really like these. Um, like, this model... Jeez, that's friggin' awesome. That was really... Yeah. I, I'm really impressed by all of the stuff that was in here. Um, and then lastly, pictures that I published from um, Gamma. These are made by Weird Games. Predominantly for Malifaux, but you can use them for all kinds of different things. And these are really cool... Uh, these are not pre-painted, by the way. Like this was, these are studio painted, but these are um, like hard plastic, like kind of like GW style terrain, like that kind of plastic. But they're these modular kind of buildings that you can use for fantasy. You could use these are designed specifically kind of for Malifaux, but they'll work in a lot of different things. And like that entire roof comes off, and then you can put a different roof on there to make it look like a totally different building. Um, you know, this is another angle. This paint job was amazing because all of this like. Like, like this part over here, if you can see my mouse, I think you can. Yeah, I you can see it. So all this part over here is like actually textured and like this is the plaster that came off. But a lot of this is just paint. Like it's not that cracked in the actual plastic. The person that painted this just did an astounding job. Um, so yeah. Um, and like the way that they've got like this green all over it. It's almost like it's got like moss kind of sticking to it. Really, really well done. And then here you can see like the plastic buildings themselves. Um, and how the, like you could take this uh, roof off and put it on that and then vice versa and get different buildings and it comes they've they got four different kits I picked up two of them at Origins last year because they were not out yet but they were selling them at Origins they brought like a selection of the stuff of the packages and they were like well this is kind of the first time they've been out available for purchase and so I bought some because um, I thought they were really cool I will probably use them for like Age of Sigmar or um, maybe Song of Blades and Heroes, that kind of stuff. Um, although there is a third edition of Malifaux coming out soon. So brand I mean, new rules, I don't know that they're going to be a huge change. I'm not sure. Actually, I don't know much about them other than there's a new rule set. Uh, so there's a potential that I could maybe, if the rule set's really good, I might look into getting back into Malifaux a little bit here and there. So we'll see how it goes. But at the very least, the buildings I think are very cool. So I picked some of those up as well. All right, so I'm gonna get out of this screen and go back to this screen and then click on that and click on that and then click on this. All right, so I, uh, if I deafened anyone, I apologize. I did not realize that that audio was gonna be routing through or that it was gonna be very loud. Um, so sorry about that. But otherwise, yeah, it, uh, Warcry I think is gonna be interesting. I am looking forward to finding out more about it. Like I said, another week and a half and um, I'll let you guys know about it although you'll probably be able to read it just as well as I will. Although, like I said, I'll be at the event. But those press events now, honestly, for Games Workshop, 
Like, they're cool and everything like that, but as soon as the, like, literally the minute the press event is done, that stuff's all on, um, uh, you know, the Warhammer community website. So there might be something that gets said or questions that get answered or whatever. There's definitely, like, a, a specific, there's kind of a, a fun to, like, oh, we're going to hang out and we're all going to learn this first. But honestly, it, minutes later, it's on the internet. And I'm not talking about the people in the audience. Like, you're not supposed to, like, be tweeting it or anything like that, although I'm sure some people still do. But there's no point to it, because if you just wait a couple more minutes, you'll see the full, instead of, like, 280 characters or whatever Twitter is these days, you'll just see full articles about all the stuff that they've talked about during the uh, show. So um, not this upcoming Wednesday, the Wednesday after that, probably around 7 or 8 o'clock p.m. Central Time, maybe a little bit later, that's probably when you'll start to see a whole bunch more news about not just Warcry, but everything coming out of GW stuff because they'll have the next big press event. Um, the first press event that they did at Adepticon, which was the first big press event they did after kind of being not a great company for a long time, and then they got the new CEO and all that. Um, the, the first big press event they did was at, uh, I think it was two years ago at Adepticon, I think. And that's when they announced Shadespire. And then not only did they announce it, but then they were like, oh, by the way, you can play it right now. And then they like opened up like another room and then you could demo it and play like a beta version of the rules right away. The game itself didn't come out till October, but in March they were, or well, April, no, March, late March, they were like, here, we just announced this game. Oh, and by the way, here it is, you can play it. And so that was really cool. I've been to several press events that they've done since then uh, at LVO and at Nova and at uh, Adepticon. And um, that's a hard one to have... And that one I wasn't at. The one where they announced um, Shadespire, I wasn't there, sadly. But from everything that I've seen, they have not been able to get to quite that same level. You know what I mean? Um, so that's kind of a bummer. But it's hard to be every time try to outdo yourself, you know? that's. But that's... Something to be said for start small. You know, if you start with the big knock it out of the park first time, people kind of expect after a while. So that's how it works out. Um, let me see here. What else? Caesar says, those buildings all look amazing, especially interested in the trees. Yeah, those trees are also super cool. I'm really looking uh, for that. Christopher asks, what scale is Malifaux? Um, pretty much 28. Maybe just a scotch taller. Maybe closer to 32, but pretty much 28 uh, millimeter scale. So yeah, I it works out pretty well that way. Um, let's see here. What else? Uh, do you have any opinions on the new Blood Bowl models I'm being asked? I saw the... Um, Halflings. I saw the halflings. They were also in that case that had all the sh the shadow spear stuff in it. But I did see the halflings there. Um, they were very well painted. They were cool little models. I don't know that I personally would run them. I'm not super into halflings necessarily. Um, I, I did finally get my um, Nurgle uh, Blood Bowl team, so I will work on that and then probably alternate between running Nurgle and Skaven. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that they're, they're still pushing stuff into Blood Bowl, and I'm glad that there's finally a halfling team for people who are into that kind of stuff. So that, yeah. Let's see here. Um, Future Get says, Warcry exclusive minis, just like Necromunda has exclusive minis. I'd like if Warcry expands with others than Chaos. No, I agree. That, that would be nice if they would go outside of Chaos. But, you know, to be fair, you might be right. They might be taking... So, like, Kill Team was a game which you use the models you already have, and then Necromunda was like... Uh, let me take that back. So Kill Team was a three-dimensional style game, but using models you already have. So it's a terrain thing, but also models that you probably already have. Necromunda, flat, mostly two-dimensional. You can technically play it three-dimensional, but you need to buy an extra book, and it's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, so you it's predominantly flat, but uses models that are specific to that game the gangers and all that kind of stuff. Warcry would then be like a third category where it's using specific exclusive models. Exclusive is the wrong word, but you see what I'm saying. Basically all these weird chaos like pit fighter t folks and then also has three-dimensional sort of terrain. That's an interesting way to look at it, honestly, because yeah, at that point now you've got multiple, again, 
what Games Workshop is doing because I think, like, frankly, lately, they're a smart company. They're looking at all the different ways that you that they can get you into the hobby. It used to be for years, the way to get into the to, to the board gaming hobby through Games Workshop was you either started playing 40k and bought an army, or you or you started playing generally, you know, fantasy and bought an army. And both of those were very daunting. Now, then finally, like in 2008, they were like, "Hey, what about um, you know, uh, Silent Death? How about that?" Which is what got me into the hobby initially, kind of. That's what brought me back, technically. I did play some BattleTech in, in middle school, but then back then we used to play with the cardboard um, little standees that had the pictures of the mechs on them. We didn't actually play with the models. Um, but now they're looking at it like they want to have as many possible options for getting you into the game from Shadespire to even further back like Blitz Bowl and and uh, uh, Space Marine Adventures and stuff like that, all the way up to 40K and, and, and that kind of jazz, and a lot of different things in between. So that's a good point. Like, Warcry, if you take Necromunda, Kill Team, and Warcry, they are all small skirmish on a board, but they all kind of have different sort of levels, and that's not physical levels. But you see what I'm saying. That That's an interesting way to look at it. <clears throat> all righty. But is there a halfling with a squirrel on his head? I didn't notice if there was one. I saw a bunch of halflings using... It looked like some of them were using pots and pans as uh, as uh, helmets. So that's, you know, pretty much on point. That makes sense. Um, uh, is Warcry Fantasy Kill Team? Sort of. Except that in Kill Team you used predominantly models that they've already produced. Whereas Warcry seems to be they have made a specific line of models for Warcry, and it seems to be chaos on chaos battles. So that's kind of an interesting thing there. When selling my old 40k models on eBay, I'm planning on stripping them first. Is it better to reassemble and sell, or to leave them in disassemblies? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would probably sell them disassembled, because then that way... Because some people, especially if they're... Well, if they're metal, there are going to be cert there's going to be a certain faction of people who want to go back in and pin them. And so if they have to take them apart just so they can clean out all the glue and then pin them again, you know. Secondly, uh, disassembled models generally never fall apart in shipping because they've already, they're already apart. So that's something to think about as well. If you send them a bunch of parts wrapped in, like, uh, 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 bubble wrap, like, that's fine. If you have to send them a model that you've already put together in bubble wrap, there's still a possibility of an arm comes off anyway, so kind of waste of the time. So honestly, generally, if I'm going to be buying a model and I know I have to strip it, I know it's going to fall apart anyway. So if you've already stripped it and it's apart, I'll put it together because then I'll use the glue that I want to use and I'll use the style I want to use, pinning. I might want to convert it. Yeah, I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't bother building them again. Um, just spending more time on your part, really. Um... What else have we got here? The Harrower says, I bet Dark Oath slash Slaves to Darkness is a pretty big release that adds a lot of these Warcry minis. Yeah, there's also that possibility too. Um, like, like I said, down the road they might decide to start moving into other stuff. I can't tell, frankly, if the game is only Chaos or if they're going to expand later into allowing, you know, Stormcast and Skaven and Nurgle and Tree People and all that kind of junk in there. Um... Sylvaneth is the actual word. So yeah, we'll see how it works out. Um, according to Nevosus, there are already a few uh, halflings with squirrels on them. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Scott R. says, It was great seeing you at Las Vegas Open this year. Hope you had a good time. I did. I did. Las, Vegas, Las, Vegas, Las Vegas Open is a good time. Uh, I do enjoy that. Uh, Andrew Play, Could Warcry be a new sort of... or a, Could be a sort of new Mordheim? No. I mean, no. It will have a three-dimensional kind of aspect that Mordheim did, and it will have war bands. So in that aspect, yes. But it's not... And it looks like there will also be some, you know, like, what do you call it, uh, uh, character progression, you know, like campaign play, narrative play, stuff like that a little bit. But it's not the same thing 
it's a very different style. Like, I guess you could say, well, if that's the case, then like Kill Team is basically also more time. You know, I mean, if you're going to get like, well, it's like just got a few bunch of models. You got two war bands. It's played three eventually on a board. It's small. Sure. But at A, it's 40K in comparison. This is Age of Sigmar. It seems to be like, again, battles between chaos, like pit fighter crews basically over this stuff. So it's not, they got the treasure aspect from it. It's, the, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, it's close. Let's just say that. I don't know. That's, that's the best I got for that. Um, George says apparently GW social media has hinted at expansions adding non-chaos in the future. Well, you would think that would be the case. I mean, if they are going to follow along the kill team line at all, I could see this game coming out for a while and then having the two forces, maybe having some more forces where they're all chaos because they had all those different icons. So there might be up to like, what, six different chaos forces. And then down the road, like releasing a book kind of like the commander's book or the elite's book or the arena book maybe or not arena book but arena thingy you know for kill team where it's an expansion and then it has an army thing that says well let's say you wanted to bring in some stormcast let's say you wanted to bring in some skaven whatever you could do that um yeah i could see that being the case uh let's see max obug says i hope that those chaos guys are kind of a starting set for Warcry, but that we can use common models after the hype has passed yeah that'll be That'll be left to be seen. Um, if I had to guess that maybe they are trying to blend the Necromunda style game with the Kill Team type game, in that, like, so Necromunda, you predominantly play it with gangers, and they've released the gangers. Like, they've released the original set, and it was Eschers versus Goliath, and then they put in Vansar and, and, and all that other stuff. I could see them doing that maybe with this, where you get the, the two starters, and then that's the, your, what you fight with for a while, but then close after that, they release another box that's got just these particular people. Because again, like in that video, which I'll go back to, no, I won't. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. And audio's off, so just sorry about that again. I apologize. Um, but at some point in this video, there were symbols... there so you've got six symbols there and then if we go on a little ways see there's these two symbols which seem to be maybe the starter forces if that's the case then my feeling is is that there's probably going to be at least four more releases that are going to cover all the rest of the symbols yeah, yeah, there um so that those guys, those guys, those guys, and those guys, and then maybe they'll release a book saying, oh, and if you want to use these guys, you know, here's an army list of other stuff or whatever. You guys can't see that. I didn't click on that. All right, let me try that again. So again, here's the symbols. Here's the six symbols, and uh, it's it's been a long week. All right, so here's the six symbols that I was talking about, and then when you let it go a little bit, two of them pop forward, and then you see those forces, which again leads me to believe that these are the two forces that come in the starter box, and then they will probably over time release four more, uh, kind of like the boxes that they do for Necromunda, where you've got here's a box of Ansar and here's a box of these guys and whatever. And then um, you can choose if you want to add on or if you don't or whatever. And then maybe after that's all done, then they will release a book that maybe has like army lists in it. So you can add Skaven, you can add Nurgle, you can add... Uh, beast uh, goat people whatever and go down that road so yeah we can see that i'm going to try to bring that back and i'm going to do this and some other stuff click on that go over here there we go all right so um i think the cello's eyes are falling off uh very one of them is a little wonky i'm not gonna lie he, he, he had a rough night um, let me see here. Hmm. Brian Griffith says, interestingly enough, the War Queen, no War Queen novella that GW put out featured a few different Chaos Barbarian tribes in a multi-level fighting pit. Hmm. Interesting. Possibly some sort of uh, uh, telegraph trickery to let us know that that's what's going on. Yeah, I could see that. 
Uh, Kyle Smith says, I hope that they also release War Scrolls for the figures that come with Valkyrie. Yeah, or Warcry, probably is what you meant to say there. But yes, they most likely will. I mean, if they've released War Scrolls for all of the Warbands in Underworlds so that you can use those in Age of Sigmar, I think they would be silly to not do that in this. They added uh, Kill Team stats and regular 40k stats for all the stuff that came in Blackstone Fortress. So, again, the, the thing that gamers love is i bought this but i can use it in multiple ways that's because it, it it's perceived value as soon as you say yeah i buy this one thing but i can use it to play in three different games like people love terrain that they know that they can use in this game this game and that game if you make a piece of terrain that really only technically works very well in one game it is seen as less valuable than a piece of terrain that can do double or triple duty um certain types of like older European houses can be used in fantasy games, but can also be used in like World War II games, if you're talking European theater. But if it's like really over the top fantasy house, like it's got all kinds of like skulls on it and crazy, and it's got a dragon sitting on top, well, that's not going to be a World War II house. But if it's just like a normal, you know, um, like even a, a ruined Tudor style house could technically just have been an old house that was up kept quite well until it was shelled by the Nazis and now it's sort of busted up and you're having a battle around it and say something like bolt action that I've done that myself um, I have used the bolt action ruined Hamlet buildings in um, you know fantasy style games because the buildings work it, it's just fine so yeah definitely <clears throat> Um, Fred, or sorry, Ford, not Fred, but Ford Davenport says, do you play cello? I do not, but my wife does. Um, Nick had some fun while Adam was away. That's very possible. That uh, there's, I mean, the booze is all still over here, but um, I don't, I don't know what he was doing. Joshua says, hey, first time watching the show live. Thanks so much for all the videos and advice, which brought me back into 40K after leaving about 5th edition. Currently agonizing over which airbrush to get. Yep, I can totally get that. Um, it's, uh, oh, which airbrush to get? I don't know. I like, right now, I would say the best brands out there are probably going to be uh, Iowata, at least the ones that I've used. Iowata, Badger, and I have messed with, like at trade shows, in, including this trade show, uh, Grex. So Grex, their their big kind of airbrush has got like a trigger instead of pushing on the top. It's more of a triggery thing, um, but I've just messed with it like at the show, and you know it, it's it's interesting. I could definitely see it being really good with like a bigger needle for like a lot of base coat colors, especially on terrain. Um, airbrushing like big pieces of terrain, especially like like those two foot by two foot squares for um, uh, realm of battle boards. Airbrushing those is no fun. Um, Frankly, just trying to get those big battle boards into my airbrush room is not very easy either. But uh, yeah, so, uh, but I could see doing terrain with the Grex kind of more trigger kind of action. I could see that working well. Otherwise, like I said, I generally use Iowata and I've got some Badger brushes as well. Um, I know there's one Harder and Steinbeck, something H&S, which is more of a European brand. And I know a lot of people like to talk about that one too. So it depends on where you live partially as well. So that's where... Um, that's where that comes from. Um, hi, what do you think of the Ambots robots? Got a box, didn't like the head, so I made them in my AdMac army. Um, well, you know, I I kind of like them. Um, I picked these up actually before I left for my local shop, and I'm really looking forward to putting them together. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to use them for, because I don't really play Necromunda, but they're awesome little models. And so... Um, there's a part of me that wants to just replace one of their heads with like a big like orc knob head so it's just like he's a like he's got a completely like robot body and all he's got left is his head i think that'd be a lot of uh, fun but again i'd also don't play really orcs i mean mm, i wonder if i could put him in my orc kill team that'd be awesome hmm, i'll have to look into that um but yeah no i'm looking forward to building those models because when i just saw the pictures of them i was just like well yeah i gotta get that that's 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 a great looking mo uh, model actually it's two oops sorry i hit the microphone there but yeah it's two models um so uh, yeah they're actually they're real simple well not simple they're actually a lot of parts but it's just like there's a sprue it's just a, 
I believe it's just two of this sprue inside the box and a couple of bases, which are the Necromunda like molded bases. I don't know if I'll use those or not. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a nice little set. Um, they're not as big as I thought. Like I thought they were going to be like a good size, but they're actually just a little bigger maybe than a Terminator. Um, no, I can't get it back in the box. There we go. So anyway, um, uh, JP Got Rocket says those Ambots are great and a seriously awesome price point. Yeah, I agree. I thought that they were also a pretty good price point too because it's two models for forty bucks. Whereas when you think about a lot of the GW like character models, a lot of them are thirty five dollars for one guy. So this is two models that are pretty customizable for forty bucks. It's a pretty good deal. Um. Let's see here. A lot of people talking about what airbrushes that they use. Eric Sheely says magnets. Where's a cheap place to get them? Um, where have I gotten my most recent magnets from? I think eBay, honestly. Um, there's a lot of stores. Well, there's some stores. Not a lot of stores. But there are some stores, if they carry like a lot of stuff for miniatures, then they will carry um, the... Rare Earth or Neomimididum Osgiliath uh, um, magnets. And um, yeah, so I would take a look at your local store first and see if they carry them or can get them. And then I would probably take a look maybe at eBay. There's other places obviously that sell them too, but eBay I think is where I found the best deals that I can remember off the top of my head. Um... Let's see, what else have we got here? Daryl says that the uh, Terminators are smaller than Ambots. Ambots barely fit on the 40 millimeter bases that they came with. Well, that's good to know too. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, so yeah, if they're kind of a little bit bigger, that's also very cool. Um, Andreas says, or you could get 30 dwarves instead of those Ambots if you're not uh, wedded to GW, but then I'd have 30 dwarves. But if I want the Ambots, that's what I would have to buy to get the Ambots. I'm not saying that, you know, that you shouldn't obviously buy what you like. Don't get me wrong. But I, when I saw those robots, I was like, I really like those robots. And then when they, it turns out that they were only 40 bucks for the two of them, I'm like, cool. Now, admittedly, other companies will sell you lots more models for the same amount of, price, same amount of money. And that's fine, um, specifically if you play those games or if you want 30 dwarves. But for this, I wanted those two robots. And, I mean, I could have seen them deciding to charge more. Um... There gets to a point where I decide, well, maybe I don't want those two robots as much because I don't want to pay that much money. But when I saw this, I was honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. So that's where that was at. A lot of companies here talking about, or a lot of companies, a lot of people here talking about the companies that they like to buy their magnets from. So this is a good uh, place to look for that kind of information. Um, a lot of people also talking about Amazon. Oh, I know where I saw magnets recently. The Wish app, which I think might, I don't know if it's wish.com. I don't know. I used to have it on my phone. Uh, I used it to buy socks, the Wish app. I bought a bunch of cheap socks one time because uh, my brother told me about it, and it was it's like, and they were okay. That they, they're not going to hold up forever, but I also got a whole bunch of socks for like six bucks. Um, but now that I mentioned, I think I actually did order magnets from Wish. The one issue with Wish is that stuff doesn't get shipped quickly. I've never had anything not get shipped, but then again, I haven't ordered a lot of stuff from Wish, so. Now that I mention it, I do think I remember actually trying to order some magnets from Wish, and I don't know if they've showed up. They might be at my P.O. box, honestly. I'll have to go look. Um, that's a good point. Uh, let me see. Travis Becker says the Magnet Baron. Uh, I saw him. He was at the Gamma, and he was also at LVO. Yes, yes. It's a nice guy. <clears throat> um... What else have we got? Subversion Art says, if you're in the market for an airbrush and you're in the Chicago area, you owe it to yourself to bid to visit Midwest Airbrush Supply. I did not realize that there was a store with just airbrushes. That's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, more people saying that they pick up their magnets on Amazon um, or on uh, Green Stuff World. I can see that, sure. Um, 
Calcium Kid says a strange thing is that they have Warhammer 40k models on Wish. I've never seen that. I should look. I will bet that they are probably recasts. I am sure that they are probably... Well, they might be kind of illegal. I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not a big fan of, like, recasts. There's a lot of... What do you call them? Uh, Chinese recasts, I think, where, you know, I, some, some manufacturing plant over there, either they're the plant that originally made the stuff, maybe, that then... GW sells, or they bought like the Forge World stuff from GW and then made molds themselves, and then they're reselling it. That's illegal, you know. And I know a lot of people are like, "Yeah, but now I can save like it's only a quarter of the price." Yeah, but it's still you're you're hurting the company that's doing the actual physical design, which makes them not be able to do as many designs, you know. And there's a definitely a an argument to be said for like, well, but fine cast is too expensive. Well, that. That may be the case. Um, to some people, they think it's priced fine and they'll order it. I don't order much stuff from Finecast because I do find it to be kind of expensive. Not necessarily for what it is, but for what it is for in relation to my life. Do I want to spend $2,000 on, you know, a, what, are you, what do you call it, a Titan that's this big? No, because where am I going to put it, first of all? Um, but I also wouldn't spend $400 on a Titan that big that was a recast because A, it's taking you know money away from the people who originally designed it, and B again, where the heck am I going to put it? So, you know, um, I have bought some fine cast stuff, but it's always been like shoulder pads or like heads. I picked up a little package of heads that are technically fine cast, I think, uh, from not fine cast, Forge World. Sorry, Forge World is what I meant. Uh, yeah, Forge World. It, uh, it, I picked up some heads from the Forge World booth at LVO. And, yeah, no, I don't know that a fine cast um, Titan would even be able to stand. Forge World's a different story. Um, all right, so that's where that's at. Uh, Martin Van Wetzel says, Support the art. Recast should not be a thing to consider if you love the hobby. I, I agree. I do. I really do. Um, Twelve Neef says, Just had a thought. What if the war... But what if the Underworld's war bands for Chaos cross over to Warcry? Hmm. That'd be interesting. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. If they made... Well, I don't know what they're going to call them. I don't know if they'll call them War Scrolls or they're going to call them something else. But if they made, basically, War Scrolls for Warcry from, like, Magor's Fiends and pretty much all the rest of the Chaos-style stuff that's already been released for, um, for Underworlds, that'd be interesting. It'd be kind of an interesting way for them to kind of go the other direction. You know what I mean? Again, like you, you, you get to double dip, which we as gamers like to do. Like I bought these guys, but they work for this and for that. Or I bought this building and it works for this and for that. That's always a benefit. So that, that'd be kind of smart. VJ Morph says, yeah, I'd be surprised if the Dark Oath ones didn't. Yeah, exactly. They kind of look pretty much like what a lot of those models in that video uh, look like. So definitely. Um, JP Got Rocket says, I found out that someone is recasting my stuff. I'm considering legal action. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, unfortunately, is that sometimes when it's like overseas or something like that, then legal action can get super expensive, if not just all out completely difficult. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 I get you. Um, hmm, what else? There was another question here about, oh, uh, I saw an Everqueen at Games Workshop the other week. Fancy looking model like the new Morathi. Any news on this as I haven't heard of anything on Wood Elves in Age of Sigmar? Yeah, we were talking a little bit about that actually during Gamma at some place about how like, you know, you've got your Sylvaneth and all that and then there are technically Wood Elves and you can play the Wood Elves. The question is, is there going to be a new sort of Wood Elf faction and they're going to sort of maybe get rid of the old models and then bring in new wood elf type models or some other sort of land elf as opposed to wet elves and um and the daughters of cain which are i don't know snake elves i'm not sure um but yeah it'll be interesting to see if, if they're going that direction like right now if you're playing sylvaneth and you want to have some like more range attack in there you got to bring in some wood elves with their bows but then you're looking for generally kind of older models uh but you can do it you know um and I don't even think it breaks allegiance if you bring those guys in. So you're you're good. You're still you got an allegiant army or whatever. But it'll be interesting to see if they um, come out with new models for that or not. And if it's just if, if they just decide to just make a 
like they're no longer called wood elves, but they're called something else, but they're basically wood elves, but they're all new, you know, that kind of thing. I could see them going in that direction. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Moist elves, according to VJ, uh, uh, VJ Morph. And on that note, I think we're going to end today's show because it's 11 o'clock. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate everybody uh, for being here. And um, I think that the bad news is, is there might be there will probably be two Sundays off in a row. And the reason for this is because next... No. Well, maybe I'll have a show next Sunday as, as a catch-up. Because the 31st, I think, of... I'm bringing up my calendar on my phone here. The 31st of March, I will be at Adepticon. So we can't do a live show then. That would be the next... That would be two weeks from today. And then the... Next Sunday after that, I'll be in Austin at the Steve Jackson Games thing. So there will be two Sundays where I will be gone. So um, let me let me noodle on it a little bit, but I will look into that and try to figure out um, whether or not we're going to do a Sunday show again next week to kind of play catch up, and then there'll be two weeks off, or how that's going to work. It might probably end up being like that. Um, also, for those of you who are Uncle Adam's regulars, meaning the 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 followers on Patreon, the four dollar followers on Patreon, the Saturday show upcoming is going to be when the next um, live show for you folks is going to be. So if that's the case, that then will be a there'll be a live show for the Patreon folks on Saturday, the irregulars, and then there will be also uh, a regular another every other Sunday show, which will just be a Sunday show uh, on Sunday. So anyway, a lot of travel going on for a while here. So um, bear with me, but um, I'm glad that you folks got to come by and, and say hi. And uh, I hope I was able to give you something to listen to while you're painting or building or whatever. Um, And we'll see you probably next Sunday, most likely next Sunday. Thanks for watching.